We are few but mighty. Amen. <laughs> if you want to, please stand. We're going to sing a couple songs here about hope and God's amazing grace. Because we have the freedom to sing about that in this country. And that's a big deal. So let's praise God. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night And through the darkness Your loving shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living
take a, a few moments to pray together. Abba Father, 
God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, eternal one, faithful one, the Father of compassion who comforts us in all our troubles, the God who knows the end from the beginning, nothing is hidden from you, even the darkness is as light to you, Lord. You are faithful in all your ways, and there are no words that can come close to praising you in the way that you deserve. Lord, you have held nothing back from us. And yet we confess, Lord, that we fall short of your glory every day. We have been in places, done things, thought thoughts, said things that did not lift you up, that misrepresented you, and yet you are the God who forgives. Your grace is unending. You are faithful to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness whenever we pray and ask for forgiveness. What a God you are. And Lord, today we celebrate the whole idea of freedom. Lord, I pray that we would have a better conception of just what that freedom means for us as we come before your throne of grace. Father, I thank you for this community and I thank you for, for the way that you have surrounded all of us, especially my family these past weeks with love and an outpouring of caring. Lord, I thank you that that we are a community that is bound together near and far by the power of that love. And so, Jesus, I pray that uh, as we prepare to share your word this morning, that that miracle would happen once again, that the Holy Spirit would take the words prepared by one broken and faulty human beings seeking your word in faith and that you would carry the word out to each and every person that each person would receive a blessing I individually wrapped and prepared by you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We wave high the flag of freedom as a patriotic reminder to never take our independence for granted. Fireworks explode into the night sky, lighting up the darkness, reminding us of our nation's calling in the world. One nation under God. We look into the sky and remember that for all the freedom we have to celebrate, we must never forget our dependence on God. It was by His hand we were afforded our independence. So we might stand for liberty remembering he set us free from the bondage of sin so we might stand for justice for the Lord loves justice and he will not forsake his saints so we might stand for freedom because we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom we thank you God for the beautiful gift of our country may we always depend on you to sustain us What is, oops, I'm free. <laughs> what is freedom? I suspect that in our, in our world today, we define freedom far too narrowly. That freedom is something far greater than, than the externals that surround us. And um, I, I think of what we are dealing with in our culture today, the things that, that are challenging us today um, in terms of challenges to our freedom. 
people can make choices um, exercising their freedom that impinge on our freedom. The, the whole idea of what has happened in our culture in response to COVID-19 has changed our realities in, in incredible ways. And, and literally, so that others can be safe, and ourselves as well, we are radically changing um, the way we operate in life. We are wearing masks. We are being more conscious of, of sanitizing. We are, we are uh, sheltering in place. We are limiting the places that we're going. And literally, our freedoms have been sur surrendered, things that were acceptable just um, a year ago are being changed today. So what is freedom? And, and what is it that, that, we, that we long for in terms of freedom? Well, I, I have to, of course, go back to July 4th, 1776, and um, largely by Thomas Jefferson's pen as he worked with others, he wrote this preamble to the to the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, and I'll just say all people, are created equal and they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. That means that these are rights that cannot be taken away um, and, so that, and the, uh, among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I, I really appreciate what Thomas Jefferson was doing there because as individuals, we hold ideals that are beyond the reality of our lives. Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder, but the concept of slavery was something that, that was against his, his uh, ideals. And the country is still struggling with what it is to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that all people are created equal. But, you know, when you think about that, as individuals, we have ideals that are beyond the reality of our own lives. We are a dichotomy. We, we are a contradiction of terms. We can have ideals that are far above um, the reality of how we're living. And I, I see that for our nation that, that there were ideals that were stated as God inspired um, the founders of our country with ideals that were far above anything that was existing in the culture and the world of that day. And we are still not fully realizing the ideals that they expressed. But we see a struggle in our culture as we try to come to grips with, with the idea of equality, and how we deal with each other. And we have seen, we have seen many outward acts uh, in our culture today with the struggle of trying to reset our realities and the way we act toward one another and the way we think about each other. But in, in, our, in our struggle for freedom, as I said earlier, I think that our, our ideals of freedom may get way too narrowly defined by looking, by looking solely, by looking solely at the at the um, hmm, looking solely at what we see around us and how we're interacting with each other. Because I would like to suggest that the broader sense of freedom is established between these ears. The, the, the whole ideal and, and, uh, and pursuit of Jesus in the world was to come into a world that was broken to free and liberate, um, liberate those who, who were caught in this, this trap within their own minds and their thinking. And, and so we look at uh, John chapter 8, verse 12, going back to Jesus, the original freedom fighter. And here he was gathered at the temple with um, many enemies surrounding him. Enemies that were seeking to discredit him, 
enemies that were seeking to minimize his teaching, enemies that were seeking to undermine everything that he stood for, enemies not only in the, in the um, physical realm, but also in the spiritual realm. And I would like to suggest that what we are seeing today is like unto the time of Jesus. That what we see in the temporal world, what we see happening in our physical plane here, is only a representation of the spiritual battle that is going on all around us, the powers of light and darkness. And we are seeing more and more polarization and, and anger and hatred and um, inhumanity uh, happening in our, in our culture because there is a cataclysmic battle in the spiritual realm that spills over into the hearts and minds of people. Um, when, when Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, uh, uh, against these principalities and these powers in the air, we, we recognize that there is a spiritual battle going on for the hearts and minds of people. People like you and me. And, and it's, it's ramping up to a white-hot heat. And so um, uh, Jesus is talking with, with, these, with these adversaries, the, the priests in the temple, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, all those who were against him. And, and he, he begins to draw a distinction he says, I am the light of the world in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. The light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so Jesus is giving this, this incredible distinction that the powers of darkness were in the world and the power of light was in the world in the presence of Jesus and light came in to dispel darkness and that darkness that is in us he came to do battle with those who were who were being tormented and and manipulated by the power spiritual powers of darkness that were tormenting people and they were acting out of their brokenness and the darkness and so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. One of John's famous I am statements that hearkened back to the very beginning with Moses in, in the uh, burning bush. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, now whoever is all-inclusive, that means that, that anyone who chooses, there is no exclusion with Jesus. Jesus holds his arms open to a whole world of people. There is nothing too dark that they have done. There is nothing too despicable that they have done. That the, the, no thought that they have thought. No act that they have acted out. No, no type of sin that they have committed that they are excluded from the light. They are welcome to come to Him. And, and He says, So whoever follows Me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, darkness brings death. The culture of death is all around us. It is using up people every day, whether it's in addictions, um, sexual addictions, drug addictions, alcohol addictions, whatever, whatever it is, they take away life. Darkness crowds out life. And Jesus said, His light brings life. So He says, darkness and death, light and life. Following Jesus is an invitation to experience life. He said in another place, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus is for us here and now. Not just a future reward, a reward here and now for broken people struggling to experience life in spite of what is going on around us. Can it poss be possible that we can experience a freedom in our minds in spite of what's going on around us? Because I, I don't know about you, but I, I oftentimes move into this place where, where I get fixated on what's going on around me 
and I become captive in my mind to the things that are out here that I cannot control. But there is a freedom that Jesus wants to offer us in spite of what's going on around us. Our Jewish friends have a word, shalom, which means peace in the midst of the turmoil. That, that we can have peace with whatever is happening around us. And so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Now, Isaiah in chapter 5, verse 20, shares this incredible verse that has such application for us today. He, he says there, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We, like never before, are in a world where things are being redefined. Some for good, but some, some that are, are, are having terrible consequences. Our culture is in this terrible struggle for... for People who have begun to redefine darkness for light and light for darkness. Bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Good for evil and evil as good. Friends, we are in a very confused, very, very active time in our culture where, where people... Because of, I mean, even because, and I was sharing this with other people earlier, because of COVID, technology has, has eroded the intimacy within our culture. And, and even more so now, as we are doing this physical distancing and, and these different activities, we are further and further apart from one another physically. And, and, and that, that's hard. I, I have... Um, a dear friend, Kim, uh, Kim Janicek, who lives in, in Nebraska, who uh, painted the, or draw, drew the picture of the horses in my, uh, in my uh, office. And, and she said, for the first time in 35 years, I am home for the summer. Because the horse shows that she used to dis- participate in, the um, competitions of horse and buggy that she used to do are canceled. And I thought, wow, that is a microcosm of so many traditions that have been carried on for decades and even centuries where where people are not not, um, experiencing the intimacy of culture that they once knew. And that's hard. Um, Personally, you know, as a pastor... um, the distance that that has come into ministry. I mean, you know, I'm a I'm a sheepdog. I I like being among people. I, um, and I, I need my solitude time too. But you know, that's all missing. It it's all in a state of flux, and where it's going to settle, I don't know. I mean, when we came into this, we started off thinking it was going to be a few weeks, and now it's looking like it's going to go a lot farther. But in this struggle of bitter and sweet and and evil and good and light and darkness, Jesus comes, he came in his time, and he is here now through his spoken word to call us back to the true light, to call us back to the true um, pursuit of good, to move us back into a sweetness, a sweet spot in life. In John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus continues on and he draws another distinction. And he says there, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This in John chapter 8, verse 32. And, and so here we have truth versus a lie. Truth that leads to life and sets free and the lie that makes us captive and continues into death you see where there where there is no truth it ultimately will go to death and and so jesus calls us to a truth now pilate 
who, um, who interviewed Jesus asked the question, what is truth? Today, that's being called into question all the time. What is truth? What is my truth? What is your truth? Uh, relative truth, you know, for if, if it's true for me, it may not be true for you, but you can do whatever you want. It's, and, and it gets really complicated, but Jesus is the truth that leads to life and light and freedom and so again I call us back to the to the idea of is freedom what's out here in what we're living in even though there may be repressive things going on or is freedom the more important freedom that Jesus came to establish the freedom in our minds Jesus speaks of the truth and his detractors, his enemies that he was surrounded by in verse 33 said to him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that the truth will set us free? Well, they, for being highly intelligent people, they had short memories because they had been in captivity in Egypt for 430 years. <laughs> but really what Jesus was calling into, into place was that they, were, that they were captives to, well, in, in common terms for today, they were, co- they were captive to stinking thinking. They, they were in a world that they were going to defend and they were not, they were not going to hear the truth. And you know, we are never more captive. <laughs> As a, a, um, a pastor friend of mine, Clarence Schild, once said, we are, we, are, we are never more likely to sin than when we know we are right. <laughs> that, that always stays with me because it, it's a, such a truism. And, um, and so, so they, they reject the truth when the truth is staring them right in the face. They, they had Jesus there who had come for all people. And they were God's chosen. They were the ones who should have known more than anyone else who Jesus was and what he had come to do and what he, what he wanted for his people and for all the world. But they didn't know him. They didn't understand him. They were too closed to receive him. And Jesus continues on now in verse 34. And Jesus replied, Very truly, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. And then in verse 36, he says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I I get this incredible sense of community here. That Jesus is talking about belonging. He's talking about a relationship with the light, with the truth. He's talking about being welcomed into a family that covers you. And that you will be free indeed in, in the long-term sense and in, in the immediate sense as well. That Jesus welcomes us into his family. That, that as I mentioned earlier, you know, just sensing the, the, the warmth and the support and the encouragement of my church family. My, my whole family so appreciated all the, all the wishes of encouragement, all the tangible prayers, the people who called and prayed with us, the people who sent us prayers. It, it is just so incredible to be part of, of something eternal. And that's what Jesus was offering to these very people who, who were, were rejecting him. And, and so he, he, he gives them this truth. 
And then because of the lie that they were in, the lie they were living in, and you know about those lies, right? The lies that have been spoken into our minds, into, our, into the very core of our being, never good enough, worth nothing, you'll never succeed, body image stuff. Lies that, that, have, that have carried us, you know, that everybody's, everybody's favorite but nobody's choice. Always trying to disprove the lie. To, to live in a way that, I'll show you I'm worth something. Or those who have lived according to the lie and just drop out and fall at the wayside and just stop trying. Or the, or the, or the brokenness of the, of the terror, the hurts, the betrayals that have made you feel less than human. Where are you in your workplace? Where are you in your neighborhood? Where are you in your family? Because of the lies. Because those lies... are making you captive in a world that God never intended you to be in. I'm listening to a book on tape that my son recommended to me. And it's uh, Russell Brand. And he, I was just sharing this earlier, but um, he said, you know what recovery is? In the community of recovery. He says, you know what recovery is? It's recovering the person God made you to be. You see, when, when, the, when the truth and the light of Jesus come into us, we are recovering the person that God made us to be. And I, I so resonate with that. It is so incredibly important. And, and so Jesus kind of concludes this and he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. As I said, darkness leads to death. A culture of death. We, we live in a culture of death that is based in lies. That is, that is squeezing people out and, and making, as never before, a them and us kind of culture. And, and the more you have them and us, the smaller the number of us becomes until you are the only us. Because that's the way this world works. But, but Jesus, Jesus reveals their own thoughts to them because indeed they were seeking a way to kill him because they couldn't handle the truth. They were not ready to receive it. And then he, then he says in verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me for I have come here from God. But you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. And so Jesus brings these two fathers into place. In another place he said, you can't serve two masters for you must love one and hate the other. And Jesus is saying, my father, if you, if you knew my father, you would love me. But the father you are following is the, is the one who destroys life. And, and he continues on. He says, your father, he, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see, we have an adversary in this world today who is trying to snuff out our lives. He is trying to captive make us captive in our minds to lies that will ultimately kill us. 
But Jesus came that we could be free in our minds despite what's going on around us. Now, in verse 47, he says, whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. My dear friends, my friends, my neighbors, my, 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 my whole world, I call out to you as Jesus would call out to you that if you, if you have the wrong father, be, be of good courage. You can be adopted by the good father, the one who is the father of life and light and eternity. In her book, not supposed to be this way, Lisa Turkhurst writes this, but when my brain begs me to doubt God, as it most certainly does, I find relief for my unbelief by laying down my human assessments and assumptions. I turn from the tree of knowledge and fix my gaze on the tree of life. And I want to pause right there. Notice that she ties this back to the original lie in the garden at the fall of humanity. What a powerful, powerful uh, image that she brings to light here that, that she, she ties it to the tree of life, looking away from the tree of knowledge. You see, we have a lot of knowledge in our culture today, but oftentimes that knowledge leads to a study of ourselves and a fixation on ourselves. But, but she says, fix your thoughts outside of yourself on the tree of life. And then she continues on, I let my soul be cradled by God's divine assurance. His Son who completely understands and who, who will walk with me through every step of this if I keep my focus on Him. That's how I survive the 86,400 seconds called today. <laughs> as, I, as I think about that, Those words are so powerful. But I want to tell you and just transition for a moment as Jesus talks about the truth setting us free. It it seems like our sense, Cheryl's and my sense of the truth has never been more clearly drawn than as we have gone through this ordeal with my son. We don't know whether his health started failing in, in Korea. He got deathly ill there. There are some genetic issues in our family where, where, the, where bad liver numbers have, have, um, have happened, but um, also choices. And as Jeremy ha- Jeremy's health has progressively worsened, they finally came to realize that his liver was dying, and so was he. And in, in, the, in the depths of those times... Cheryl and I, and I, you know, just speaking personally, I have never experienced a level of despair like I have when I didn't know whether my son would be alive in the morning. And, and Cheryl and I developed uh, an attitude, a discipline in the midst of those most difficult times. We we, um, adopted a battle song, which um, which is called Raise a Hallelujah, and we'll hear that song in a minute. But I texted it to my youngest son, Jacob, And this is the text message that I sent to him, and I'll just share it with you. I want to talk about the paradigm shift that comes when we overcome the lies by believing and acting on the truth. 
That is why that song became the fuel that we used when the situation with Jeremy was most desperate. We lifted up each other's arms and sang that song as a battle cry. We were trusting our lives and the life of Jeremy in the hands of our loving God. You see, we were captive to despair. We were captive to, um, to a lie that was, that was wringing the life out of us. And, and by turning away from that and looking to God and putting whatever the circumstances would be in his hands, we found a renewal. I want to share with you that song now, but I, I, there's a story behind it before they cue it. And that is, when I shared that with Jacob, and we shared that with our daughter Rebecca, they teamed up. Rebecca is, sings with a, with a praise team, and her lead singer and she laid down their, their voices um, in, in, a, in, in that song and sent it to Jacob. And then Jacob laid down a track and had them re-record, and this is on cell phones. But Jacob, w Jacob was so moved by this <laughs> that, that he, he, de he delayed his plans for a vacation and, and um, laid down the music track and then mixed it and the voice that you'll hear uh, is my daughter Rebecca and her friend Ben. So go ahead.
In the darkest of times, as Cheryl and I sang those songs, putting our, our son and ourselves in the care of God. He was in a culture of death in a hospital nearby Naples, Florida. A place where the head nurse, the charge nurse said, what does he want to hear? That he's dying? Where a doctor said to him, if you can't get a transplant, get your affairs in order. And almost overnight, he was welcomed into Tampa General Hospital where he experienced a culture of life. And miraculously, they found a liver within two days of his, of his um, acceptance into the transplant program. And two days after that, he had the new liver. And I just, I can't begin to praise God enough for the way that he interceded for our family. And in the in response to the prayers of many. So what is freedom? I started off with that question, and, and, and I would like to suggest that freedom is choosing. For some reason, this has gone away again. <laughs> anyway, fr freedom is choosing the Father of life. Freedom is choosing the Father of life, and it, as, as, we, as we put ourselves in His care, we began to experience the freedom from being bound to a, to a death, deathly grip of, of the lie. Freedom is trusting God in the moment. And I said before, you know, faith is not, um, I will have faith in the future. Faith is in the moment. So faith, freedom is trusting God in the moment that is liberating. Freedom is resting in the presence of an all-powerful, compassionate God. Resting. In whatever circumstance I'm enduring, I can rest in His presence. And freedom is knowing that God has got this. Friends, one day... One day this world will be history. We will see it in the rearview mirror. And the full, the full truth, the full light, the full glory of God will be revealed as we are brought together as a family that will never be separated and we will never experience death again. So I want to commend to you this Jesus who came into the world to share the truth that sets us free. Who came into the world to shine light into the darkness and dispel the darkness. Because that promise is for you. That promise is for me. Believe it. It is real. It is true. And it is yours to receive. Amen. As a people of light, people of truth, go into the world as a people that are free. Be, be delivered from the brokenness of this world and, and receive the liberation in your minds and your hearts. And know that God has you, the Father of freedom, the one who, who held nothing back by sending Jesus into this world to free sinners like you and me. May you be blessed. May you be free. And may you know that God has got you and he's got this situation for you. Amen. Take care. God bless you. Have a safe 4th of July. <laughs>